know, I wasn't really raised in the church, but I always had a hunger to find a relationship with God. And I actually found God in my valleys. I was going through trials where it felt impossible and I felt like I was alone. And I sought out Jesus and I fully relied on him. And he showed up and saved my life. And it was that moment I decided to give my life to God. I'm Jess Mikey and I'm all in. Good morning, Canoe Creek. Welcome, welcome back. Whether this is your first Sunday with us or this is a place where you call home and you're here each and every week, uh, excited to be together. And, you know, All In is a vision that we have been talking about now for two years. And it is a five-year ministry plan for this church. And it, it champions several core things while we continue in ministry as a whole but these essential things, we believe, have to uh, level up, so to speak, have to become more primary, have to become more important. And I would encourage you to take a look at the information in the back of the room on your way out. If you don't understand the vision or you don't know it, all the information you need is there. Uh, if you want to partner with that vision, the information is there as well. Excited to share more all-in stories of how people are growing and transforming as a result of this ministry here at Canoe Creek and what we're able to do. And so we, this week, are continuing a series we started last week on the tail end of Easter. And this series really revolves around what our theme and our drive for the whole year is all about. Our desire this year, as we've talked about, is to know and practice gospel culture. What is it? What do, what do we understand about it? Versus what sometimes happens within church culture is that the gospel is, well, what I think it is or what I believe it to be or what I've been told that it is or you know, what I desire for it to be versus just simply saying, okay, what does God's word say about the most important thing in my life um, that I believe it to be. W what is it? What are the details there? What do I need to understand and know about it? So, you know, we kicked off the year, Sean Grant and myself, we, we preached two messages that really that were talking about, hey, do we have the gospel wrong? Partially, maybe. In total totality, maybe, you know. Uh, even Easter message, I would encourage you to go back and listen to that one. Those messages are always available on the app or on our website because it really drives into that core theme. And, and this series is through the book, The Letter, called Ephesians, and it was God's word to a group of churches in this area, and it really sums up well so many details about the gospel. And, you know, last week we looked at how chapters 1, 2, and 3 are all about the details of who God is and how the gospel came to be and what does it mean. And then 4, 5, and 6 is all about, okay, well, how do I live in response to that? And so that's where we're at, and that's what we're looking at. And, and I would invite you, let's read together. We're going to be reading from Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, there are Bibles on the racks in front of you. Feel free to use one of those and keep it if you don't own a Bible and you need one. Uh, but it might be that you like using the Bible app, using your phone. In the digital version behind me, you can see where you can follow along with our sermon notes as well. You can use those notes for small group meetings later, send them to friends just for personal reference or personal study as well. Uh, we try to do all that to make it available and helpful to you. We're going to read a section of verse that was out of the broader verse we read last week in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. So follow along in your Bible or on your phone with me. Let's read this together. It says, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us and the one he loves. He has prepared us for adoption to sonship. Verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. This is God's word. 
Now, last week we started out with this passage in a broader context, and we dealt with the fact that there's some difficult things here where some different people can have very broad perspectives that disagree. And the reality of it is is some people probably need to trust more in the sovereignty of God and other people need to take ownership of their life. And, you know, and if you, I would encourage you to take a look at that message online. These days, traveling from St. Cloud to St. Cloud, you can listen to a whole sermon, you know, in no time at all in your car. So I want to point that out. But more importantly, as I pointed out last week and as I kind of gave you the structure of the book, uh, creed drives deed. That is, some people say, it doesn't matter what you believe, just be a good person. Well, the whole book is structured to say that that is the wrong type of thinking. The whole letter is structured to say, hey, here's what we know about God. This is what we know about his plan. This is what we know about those details. We call that doctrine. It's teaching. And before... Before God's word ever starts saying, okay, so this is how you should be a father. This is how you should be a son or a daughter. This is how you should be a worker. or This is how you should be this or that. He said, this is what you should know. This is what you should believe. This is what you should hold on to. And so what we believe absolutely drives who we are. And, and so if, if you're struggling to believe, as this verse said, that you have received Every spiritual blessing in heaven, that you are holy, you are blameless, and you are adopted by God, then you fail to understand how adoption works. Or maybe you experienced it poorly in this world where so many things are broken. In a world where fathers, all of them, are imperfect, and some more imperfect than others. And so because of that, sometimes we have a hard time seeing some things that the Spirit, through God's Word, is teaching us, declaring to us, and we have a hard time believing those things because God has a powerful love uh, that changes us and transforms our lives. My wife and I had the pleasure just a, a week or so back to go to a Tim Hawkins concert. Hilarious, so much fun. I laughed until... I couldn't laugh anymore, and it was painful. And, but what really caught me off guard and surprised me was uh, Mark Stewart is the first guy to walk out on the stage. And the reason why it caught my attention is because Mark Stewart, back in the late 80s, was the lead singer of a, a rock and roll Christian band called A180. And uh, they changed their name to Audio Adrenaline. Well, back in the late 80s, when they were just a group of guys who loved music from Kentucky Christian College, they were going to these small churches, and they had connection with some of the guys at the church I was at. And so they would they were playing shows at our church, and we were hanging out with them. And it was just like we were, you know, some of the guys, right? And so when I saw Mark walk out, I said, like, oh, my gosh, it's Mark Seward. Holy cow, I haven't seen him in ages, you know. And, and I knew some things about his story, but I had forgotten some of those things because in the early 2000s, they, were, they became a very big-time band. And in the early 2000s, his voice, he, he developed a condition where he could no longer sing, could not sing. It, it, was a, it was a problem. He lost his voice, lost his band, as he says himself, and then he, he and his wife ended up divorcing. Just very difficult season of life you can only imagine. He, he ends up going to Haiti where his parents, I believe, had served and were serving at the time, and he's just trying to find himself. You know, he completely lost for what we, what we sometimes do is we put our identity in the wrong thing, Right? Um, and he reminded me of something that's true that David and Elizabeth uh, Lincoln Hoker have told us about Haiti and their culture. Sometimes young ladies who have babies, uh, they, one of their options is just to discard the baby when it's born because they have no resources for that child. It's one of the reasons why we partner with an amazing ministry in Haiti as well. Um, and he was telling a story of how one young lady went into basically what is a latrine and um, a guy watched what was happening, and he knew she had that baby, and she walked out without the baby. He grabbed a U.N. worker, and they went and um, went in and, and literally busted open the concrete opening and 23 feet down, went down to get the baby. The baby was still alive. And the really powerful reality in that story is that 
Mark found uh, new love, remarried. All he ever wanted to be, he said, in many ways was a father. And that baby ended up becoming Mark's child. He adopted her. Um, they since, uh, in, in the midst of all that too, they adopted another son from Haiti as well. This brother and sister uh, have a beautiful family. And um, Mark has, as an adoptive father, as a family, done what the scriptures are trying to help us understand is that beyond just simply the reality of rescuing, everything that is his is hers, belongs to his children. He has given to, to her, to his son, everything that's his. That's When you adopt, that's what happens. That's what you do. And as we look at Ephesians chapter 1, it says that we are adopted to, to God the Father, that uh, we are holy, we are blameless, we are gifted with every spiritual blessing. This is what we are being told. This is the image of it. This is an, a living example of it. Here's the reality, too. No other religion claims that you can be adopted by the Creator. Because it's crazy. It's, it's like this wild idea. But God doesn't worry about what's hard to believe and what's crazy and what's ludicrous and all that. He just simply had a plan. He established a plan, and his loving kindness is walking the plan out. Regardless of whether people think it's crazy or not, he does it. And, and his scriptures declare it. And our invitation is based on the expense, our invitation to be adopted by God is based on the expense of our older brother, who is Jesus, who is our Lord. Our adoption to sonship is through Jesus Christ, it's through his blood. And the reality of it is, is adoption is not a natural activity. It's not. It is a choice. It is a decision. It is a pursuit. <laughs> it is a gift. And it says it's not just that we are giving one amazing spiritual blessing. Oh, you're saved. No, we're given every spiritual blessing that comes with being an adopted child of God. Many times we make a choice Regarding this or that, is it worth it? Is it valuable enough? Do I want to, okay, I like it, but am I going to pay that for it? And God declares a value and a worth in the adoption that he does with us. And that is important to remember. Here's what that means. The highest thing God could do for us is adopt us. It is the highest thing. It is the most powerful thing, it's the most important thing, it's the most beautiful thing. We get so hung up on salvation. I need to be saved. You need to be saved. We need to be saved. There's people out there that need to be saved. We need to get some people saved. And at the end of the day, we have a church that is so focused on saving people that we have saved people who have no idea of what it actually means to be saved. Other than, oh, I show up, you know. I sing some songs, I do some stuff, and we have a church culture that's so focused in that way that we miss the amazing spiritual blessing of adoption. And, and so we're looking at a spiritual adoption by the creator of the world. This means everything is perfect about it. Everything is good about it. Everything is right on point. Uh, now, this doesn't mean everything about our life Everything about the world and so on is perfect, but God's plan, his process, his promise, all these things, those things are perfect. And we struggle with this idea because our family and our fathers are not always the most perfect things. And so sometimes our images have to be replaced by what the Spirit is teaching us. And here's what this means. Because God is perfect, his love is perfect. Do you know what that means? He cannot and he does not love you any less than he loves Jesus. That's a powerful reality. That's the only way he can say you're holy, you're blameless, you're my son or my daughter. 
and it's so important to recognize. I used an illustration last year. Maybe you remember it quickly. It's about a family. They had their own biological child. They adopted two children. The family was separated over an inheritance issue. Money was given by the loss of a loved one. And one of the spouses wanted to give all three children equally the same kind of college money. One of the spouses said, no, our biological child gets more. The family broke up over it. God doesn't love us like that. He loves us the same as he loves his son. God loves us with that same kind of love that he has for Jesus. John 17, then the world will know that you sent me, Jesus says, and have loved them, that's us, even as you have loved me. So every person who has received Jesus as their Lord and as their Savior has also received the love of the Father in the same way that he ultimately loves his Son, Jesus. So this is why the passage can say, you are holy, you are blameless, you are without sin, and you are redeemed. Now, one important distinction here that I've got to call out because we see this cycling back through in generation after generation in different ways. This does not mean we become a part of the Godhead. This does not mean we somehow have a seat at the table, so to speak. We are adopted and we still submit to the Father. Jesus is still our older brother who is our King and our Lord and the reason why we can have salvation. And this is important because this is what Eastern religion Religions will typically tell you this is what new age mysticism that we see recycle throughout generations typically tells us. There's a false idea that we become God or we become the essence of God or we become part of God in the typical language is, you know, the idea of you create your own reality. If you hear those words, no, they ain't speaking the same language as you are speaking. Uh, The only thing that is true, the only thing that is real is God, and he's the one who creates the reality in which we live. There's a very big difference between becoming a child of God and submitting to the Father. But adoption does mean Jesus is our older brother, and God is our loving adopted father. Hebrews chapter 2. Both the one who makes people holy, Jesus, and those who are made holy, us, are of the same family. you got a new family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. Now, uh, this is a direct contrast to what we see in the prodigal son. This parable of two brothers, and one of them says, I want my inheritance. And he takes his money from his father, and he runs off, and he lives foolishly, and he is absolutely humbled by his foolishness in life, and he humbly drags himself back to the Father. And he says, look, I'm not worthy of being your son. Just make me a servant, make me a slave, whatever it is. And the Father graciously receives him and does all the things in blessing him to make him a son again. And this is great for everybody in the story except for the older brother. He's not happy with this. You know why? Because when the dad says, hey, kill that calf, we're going to have a party, and all the money it takes to have that party, whose money is that? It's the older brother's. Because what was the inheritance of the younger brother, it's already been spent, everything the father now has. That belongs to the brother who stuck around. He's not really happy with it. And we get this radical contrast of generosity in our older brother, Jesus, who graciously sacrifices his life even in the midst of our foolishness when we walk away from the Father. And so the point, Jesus is a very different older brother. He's gracious. He serves the Father's will even at the expense of his life and the sacrifice he's willing to endure. And so just as the older brother of the prodigal had to endure the sacrifice of what was his now belonging to the younger brother, but he didn't do it graciously, Jesus now graciously says, what is mine is yours, and I'll make the sacrifice to give it to you. And so the purpose was not just to bring us into the family as some sort of 
slave or servant. It was to make us a son or a daughter. It receives every spiritual blessing. And one of those spiritual blessings is we have Jesus, who is our older brother, and he's the king of God's kingdom. And so let me take that a step further. Look with me in Romans chapter 8, where it says, we know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to this present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. Now, just before this, in verse 21 or 22, I think, Paul says that we are adopted, but then in this verse it appears to say, well, hey, we're still waiting on that to take place place. And so we're like, okay, which one is it? Well, the reality of it is when you adopt a child, you may be able to give that child everything under the sun. But the one thing you cannot give it is you cannot give it your DNA. Mark could give everything that was his to his daughter, to his son. He cannot give them his skin pigment. He cannot give them his his binary code, so to speak, or a part of who he is. And the reality of it is, in, in life, God gives us so many amazing blessings. One of them is the presence of the Spirit in our life, which, in fact, we see it tells us it is a deposit of the inheritance that is yet to come. And that's the point, is that we know in God's Word, it goes on to tell us other places, Paul writes, that we're going to be changed and, and how we're changed fully, we may get some details about that, but it's a mystery we don't even know. But it's in that amazing transformation that maybe in that point we begin to take on even the fuller weight, the, the greater glory of God in our lives. Just as we talk about the kingdom of God, it is now and not yet. Jesus is not waiting to be king. He is king. Therefore, the kingdom exists right now. But his fullest glory and all the things that are going to come as a result of that are yet to happen. It's like this ongoing process in which God is preparing to drop some amazing things on us. Now, remember, in this opening section of the book, it's so important. I spoke about this last week. We are so hung up sometimes on just seeing things through our own lens. And we're really quick, especially when it comes about salvation. Well, you know, I need to get saved or I don't feel good about myself or I need to fix my family here or fix this there or fix that there. We just come at it from what we want, from what we see, from how we desire things. And what does God do? He starts this whole letter off, hey, let me take you up to about 100,000 feet and let me show you the world, salvation, spiritual blessings, the richness of the spirit in your life from my perspective. And he radically shapes how we see how every spiritual blessing in this gift of adoption is given over to us. Even that point of, remember, it says, the spirit is a deposit of greater things to come in the inheritance. The Spirit affirms who we are. The Spirit teaches us about adoption, and the Spirit of God is working to remove our fear. Fear is a lack of listening to the Spirit who tells us we are the children of God. Remember, I want to say this till the day I die, two things that I know to be eternal, God's people and God's word. Where are you at with both of them? Maybe you know God's word from beginning to end. Maybe you're a great scholar. Good for you. I'll bake you a cookie, okay? And you can tell everybody in this room where they're wrong or how they don't know this or how they don't know that. And yet you sit in a room by yourself most of the time. There's a problem with that. And yet, and God wants you to understand the blessings, the blamelessness, the holiness, the redemption, uh, the removal of sin. And yet, it's hard for him to do that when you don't have his word in front of you. To know it, to understand it, to, to grasp it more deeply. When you're defining the gospel based on grandma's definition or the world's definition, or maybe just a, you know, a quick sentence on Instagram because, I mean, that's all we need anymore, right? Just some influencer to tell me how am I supposed to be or what I'm supposed to look like or what the gospel is versus actually exploring it for ourselves. 
And, and let me make sure before I go into this last little section, I'm going to read one more verse and say a couple things here. Let me, let me make sure I set everybody at ease about something. This text is sonship. That may frustrate some of the ladies in here, but you've got to understand, when he says that, he's applying it to both men and women. And you may be thinking, well, that just seems a little sexist and whatever. I don't know. Okay, what? Well, understand, in their culture, women had no rights. The fact that he's saying sonship and he's applying it to both daughters of God and sons of God means that he's saying to everyone they have this authority they have this power. They have this inheritance. What he's saying is extremely subversive in their culture. It's in their face in what he's saying. And so look with that in mind at Galatians 4. It says, but when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we may receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons. When was the, hey, listen, I'm sorry. When was the last time in our culture you, you, instead of hearing somebody say, I got saved, you heard somebody say, well, you know, on this month, this day, this year, I got adopted. This says something about culture, and that's what we're talking about. We have a Christian culture that is narrowly focused in one way, and it causes us to miss the broader spiritual blessings of the gospel. Receive adoption to sonship because you are his sons. God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. This is God's word. Listen, keep in mind, these households that sometimes are described or the image that's in mind when we see certain things and when you read Galatians 4 in its broader context, it's giving you this spiritual imagery of Abraham's household versus how the, 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 the family of God works now. It's not just like some little place in the manor, you know, you got a boy, girl in the family, and it's a family of four. No, no, we're talking about massive estates. We're talking about houses that were businesses, farmlands and farm animals and lots of people. You'd have slaves, you'd have servants, and you'd have children, sons and daughters. And that's the image that we're giving here. And, and we got to understand that the slave works with fear that if they don't do a good job, something might happen to them. If they don't perform well for the master, they may get kicked out and not have a place. And the son or the daughter, on the other hand, um, if they're good, they just work for the love of the father. But they never work with this fear like next tomorrow morning I could wake up and be kicked out of my home because they're a son or because they're a daughter. And so slaves work under compulsion with fear. Sons work with joy and a spirit of freedom. Which one are you? That's the real question as we read Ephesians 1. Which one are you? How do you live? How do you approach the Father? Slaves have greater emotional swings because their life is based on performance. And some days it goes well, some days it doesn't go so well, and that really pulls at the strings of how they see their value and their worth and their emotions. Sons, daughters, they're emotionally stable because they know their performance may be up one day and down the next, but their love of the Father and the Father's love of them is not based in that. It's based in their relationship. Slaves tend to be critical people, judgmental people, quick to blame or jump on others, and not always, but their desire to control people and their environment sometimes is a way of controlling the outcome because they think the outcome always paints a picture of how they look, and they're concerned with how they're seen by other people and being blamed of something that went wrong. On the other hand, some sons have affirming spirits. They listen well. They don't gossip. It. They can give compliments and, and offers, uh, lift offers up and, and call others up. And they're able to do this because their identity is not driven by performance. 
Their identity is securely resting in the fact that they have been adopted by the Father. They are a son that is holy and blameless. And they've got an older brother who made a great sacrifice for them. A slave is someone who can't take criticism, even though they can be quick to give it. Uh, criticism is connected with fault. Fault is connected with repentance. Repentance is connected with the idea that I did something wrong. And a slave can't fathom that because everything in their life is driven on how they're seen. On the other hand, sons are not defensive. They work at being slow to speak, quick to listen, examining themselves rather than offering excuses a son is easy to talk to no matter what. You know, no matter how difficult the situation is, when you got bad news to share or difficult critical news to share, it's never fun. It's even more difficult when you know you got to share that with a person who has slave mentality because it's going to be a battle. It's going to be a fight, and it's going to be painful. A son, though, on the other hand, is easy to talk to, willing to receive and be thoughtful in the response. Now, let me just close by saying this. In some physical cases, uh, parents or family who have kids that have been adopted try and go and get those kids back. And that can be a very difficult and heavy situation. If you're a son or daughter of God, what I'm trying to say to you now is your old family is going to come after you. That's just the reality of the life. It's not all unicorns and rainbows. It's difficult. And, and here's what they might say. <laughs> Are you really a son or a daughter of God? I mean, come on. You believe that nonsense. It's nonsense, isn't it? Or when the father does something that you don't agree with, it doesn't fit your plan and your house with the white picket fence and the American dream, and it's difficult. They're going to come along, the old family, and, and say, see, I told you he can't be trusted. You just need to come on back and spend time with us. Or when you fail, when you fall short, they'll come along and they'll say, what kind of a Christian are you anyway? You see, you don't fit in this family. You don't belong in this family. And they'll heap shame on you, even though the scriptures have told you that it's been removed. If you get caught in an anxious cycle that maybe resembles something like this, if you're afraid because you're not performing well, you're anxious because you're struggling with alcoholism, anger, pornography, same-sex attraction, upset about your career, you have a sense of hopelessness, critical spirit, controlling spirit, or more, just know your old family has come for you. And they want to try to convince you of something other than what is true. The truth is God moved heaven and earth to make a family that you could be part of. And your older brother went through the greatest sacrifice he could ever make graciously so that you could be blameless and holy and redeemed and without sin. And receive every spiritual blessing beginning with a deposit of the Spirit in your life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for the gospel. And even though it may be summed up in a few simple ideas, we realize that the vastness of it is greater than what eternity can even hold. We pray that you would open our hearts and our minds through the preaching of your word and the presence of your word uh, and the spirit and those who have received you and your spirit in such a way that we would have a grander vision, a better understanding of what it means 
uh, to be adopted, to be rescued, to be saved and brought into a family where every spiritual blessing is made available to us because that's what adoption is about. So Father, we pray that you would inspire us with that truth, that it would uh, press down the, the lies of our old family that wants us back uh, so that we may remain in your embrace uh, with your love, uh, knowing that we are your sons and we are your daughters and that we may share the news of our older brother with our world as much as we can in how we live and what we say and in so many various ways and what we do that we would take captive every thought we take captive every word every sentence every moment in a day the good and the bad and we would leverage it for your glory. And we pray that as we do this, uh, your kingdom would grow and the influence of your church at Canoe Creek would be more deeply rooted into the culture uh, so that the very fabric of what Satan is trying to disrupt uh, would be changed and the language we use, the visions that we have, the understanding of your word, it would be profoundly impactful on everything around us. And Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. You know, at Canoe Creek, every Sunday we have communion elements available, as well as Mark is over here to my left, your right, Karen is over here to your left, there are prayer and decision partners this morning. If you need prayer, they're there to pray with you. If you need to give your life to Christ or you know you need to make a step and you're not sure what that looks like, or you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior and be united with the Father, Son, Holy Spirit and baptism, uh, they're there to give you guidance in God's word to take that step. But this time in the service, these elements, they are for those of us who have placed our faith in God, that we have a firm conviction of who Jesus is, that we understand the gospel in the simplest sense, that we know the steps we need to be taking as we are understanding the gospel in an even deeper fashion day after day. And so I would encourage you that as you look at these elements, the, the bread and the juice remind us of the body and the blood of Jesus because we recognize in them our older brother, the son of God, the king of the kingdom of all eternity, graciously endured for you, for me, for his bride, that is the church, you know, for us together. And so when we have this opportunity each and every Sunday, we reflect with that in mind. And I know that if you do, you'll do so in such a manner that is worthy of the son and daughter that you have been made by the power of God.